Well, hey there, this is Kat, and it is day 24 for Joseph. So, um, we are just trucking along here, just steamrolling. You know, we're on page 147. There's, I think, 215 pages in the book, and I, we're about 60 pages away. So, hey, that's awesome. Maybe seven, maybe eight more videos, depending on how much I can get in today. So, if I stop, stop talking... <laughs> Get with the prayer, and then we can start. So thank you, Father. For you are our rock, our fortress, our foundation. In you, we cannot be moved, Lord. No matter what tries to come at us, no matter who tries to do what to us, through the enemy, through you, we will prevail. We will keep on going, Lord. Because... That is our, that's your will, that is our job, that is our duty to be, behold. And I just pray that you give us strength and sustenance and overflow our cups, Lord Jesus, that we might give to others and not give anything away that is of ourselves that ought not to be given away, Lord. To overflow our cups, my Father, and we just bless you and we thank you constantly being with us and constantly being our companions and our guide and our teacher and our example and we give you all the glory thank you father amen oh that is a beautiful bright sunny day and it's getting warmer finally um into the 50s this week i heard so yeah Excuse me. Sorry, to my hair. Okay. So the last one was pretty cool. The last um, video. Finally, get into the thick of it. Finally, you know. Okay. Bottom of page 147, and if you are reading along, it's The Truth Lessons from the Story, is the title. The late great preacher John Henry Jowett used to say that a minister doesn't deserve an hour to preach a sermon if he can't give it in one sentence. So let me give you this sermon in a sentence. Greatness is revealed mainly in our attitudes. If you are under the impression that you are going to be great because of some accomplishment you've achieved, but harboring wrong attitudes, you're in for a terrible jolt. Greatness comes in the sweet spirit attitudes of humility, forgiveness towards your fellow man. Joseph sets before us a magnanimous example how beautifully forgiving he was, how generous and mercy Thomas Jefferson was correct when he said, when the heart is right, the feet are swift. Part of the reason we are so sluggish in carrying out the application of God's truth is that our heart isn't right. When that's fixed, we are fleet-footed servants of God. Don't look that up. Actually, sorry, just give me one moment. There are dozens of possibilities for a heart not being right. The heart may not want, the heart may not be right toward the person who never paid back what he owed me. The heart may not be right toward the person who divorced me. The heart may not be right toward a God who took my mate. The heart may not be right toward my now grown child who took advantage of me. The heart may not be right towards a parent who abused or neglected me or towards the pastor who took unfair advantage of me or toward the teacher who failed me. Wow. It, it takes God to make the right heart. When I have a wrong attitude, I look at life humanly. When I have a right attitude, I look at life divinely. That's the real beauty of Joseph's life. That's the kernel of truth his life represents. He was great, mainly because of his attitude. 
and there are specific lessons that grow out of that single truth, let me offer at least three for your consideration. First, when I am able, by faith, to see God's plan in my location, my attitude will be right. God sent me, God sent me, God sent me. Not until you can relax and see God in your present location will you be useful to him. A positive theological attitude will do wonders for your geographical latitude. Second, when I'm able to, by faith, to sense God's hand in my situation, my attitude will be right. I don't begin the day gritting my teeth asking, why do I have to stay in this situation? Instead, I believe that he made me the way I am and put me where I am to do what he has planned for me to do. I don't wait for my situation to change before I put my heart into the work. I suggest you give that a try. It's called blooming where you're planted. There's nothing like an attitude of gratitude to free us up. Okay. Third, when I'm able, by faith, to accept both locations and situation as good, even when there's been evil in the process, my attitude will be right. When I can say with Joseph, but God meant for it, when I can say with Joseph, but God meant it for good, then I become a trophy of grace. Our Savior is not walking the earth in flesh anymore, so we are called to bear his image to the world around us by having his attitude in what we do and say. We are saying to the world, this is the right response to the wrong treatment. This is what Jesus would do. John Newton, who wrote such beloved hymns as glorious things of thee are spoken, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds and amazing grace, also wrote another that we seldom hear anymore except in small country churches, which I love to visit. It's really a hymn about having the right attitude. How tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and sweet flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines but dim, the fields strive in vain to look gay. But when I am happy in him, December's a pleasant December's as pleasant as May. Now if you're kinda young and you think gay as in what gay is now, it is not gay in the olden days used to mean happy. So gay took on a new meaning um, as life kind of went on. But gay used to mean happy like in the 70s, 60s, maybe 60s. Maybe even earlier than the 60s, but I wasn't born yet, so I don't know. But gay used to mean happy, just so you know. And that's what he means here, especially back in the... When your attitude is right, December is as pleasant as May. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. It doesn't matter where you live. Your circumstances or conditions don't matter all that much. Your days may be tedious and tasteless. No problem. It's your attitude that matters the most. You don't have to have clear skies or cool evenings. Because your heart is right, your feet are swift. That's how Joseph made it in the pit as well as on the pinnacle. That's how you're going to make it. Whatever your situation, is your heart right? Are your feet swift? Are you moving away from people or are you moving toward them? Are you engaged in the business of healing or hurting? Are you adding pressure or relieving it? Are you bringing joy? Or squelching it? Is your December as pleasant as your May? The only way out of the pit is his way. The only solution to bitterness is his grace. Too often the fog of the flesh blocks our ability to see God's plan. Our selfishness pushes away his hand because we want it our way. Our location and our situation become irksome assignments, and life becomes a barren, cold, lifeless December. Joseph shows us that the only way to find happiness in the grind of life is to do so by faith. A faith-filled life means all the difference in how we view everything around us. It affects our attitudes toward people, toward location, toward situation, toward circumstances, toward ourselves. 
Only then do our feet become swift to do what is right. Only then is December as pleasant as May. You say you want to be considered great some day. Here's the secret. Walk by faith, trusting God to renew your attitude. Who needs that? Me. <laughs> I think we all need that. Um, chapter 10, 151. Almost every summer when I was growing up, my family vacationed at Karan Kahua Bay in a small cottage down in South Texas between Palacios and Port Alto. Sometimes those events were more like family reunions. If you have ever been to a family reunion, you'll have no trouble imagining what our reunion was like. It was a blast. For I'm sorry, just so you know that I, I kind of... um crapped it right there <laughs> for almost a week the lundies and the mays and the fridays and the swindolls all slept and ate and laughed and sang in the little four-room cottage named bite my granddaddy owned we were talking wall-to-wall -wall family fun we swam and took boat rides fished floundered told jokes and mainly gorged ourselves on fresh flounder and trout and redfish. Fried oysters and boiled shrimp were also in abundance. We also filled ourselves with biscuits and bacon and eggs in the morning along with steaks and ribs cooked on an open pit barbecue and homemade pies and cobblers and cakes and always handmade ice cream of various flavors. Everybody in the family had fun but nobody in the family was thin. Needless to say, along with us all sorts of varmints inhabited that old cottage including mosquitoes, wasps, ticks, scorpions, lizards, and horned toads. Yet none of that seemed to bother anybody because we were all there as one big family. Excuse me. We laughed ourselves hoarse as Uncle Jake told his funny stories and as my dad did some of the craziest things anybody could imagine because there were so many of us we slept wherever we could find a spot packed into that little cottage i remember laughing myself to sleep under the mosquito netting listening to my dad play one tune after another on his harmonica without using his hands while lying in bed someone would yell out the same out the name of the song and in a split second my father would play it then we'd shout out another one and he'd play that one. An old lantern glowed and sputtered in the corner in the cabin and finally burned out as sleep overtook us and snoring replaced singing. Great memories as everyone grew up and got older. Our reunions got lost in the busyness of getting an education and getting married and re rearing new families of kids. The year we buried my father, I came to the stunning realization that our family reunions were gone for good. Never again would I wade into the shadow water alongside him in the night, with a gig in hand, floundering, or pulling my end of the scene to draw up a catch of shrimp and mullet. Never again I would sit in the same boat with him and wait for them to bite, just before dawn. Never again would we harmonize on home on the ranger, and you are my sunshine. Never again would I hear the whine of his old harmonica as I drift to sleep. Precious memories, vivid, um, pastel colored memories on the, can on the canvas of my mind. Wonderful memories of the way we were back then, when life was simple and time seemed to stand still. To this day, I cannot light a Coleman camping lantern without thinking of my dad, who taught me how to do it, or crank up an outboard motor or clean a mesh of fish. Joseph never saw Karen, Karen Kahua Bay in South Texas, and he never heard the way we were. But I'm convinced that in this 30 plus years there, there were some scattered pictures of what he had left behind, some of his own pastel colored memories on the canvas of his mind? Did he each year on his birthday perhaps revisit those days in Canaan when he was still with the father who loved him and the brothers whom he grew up? Did he pause in the busyness of his work and remember when, 
Did he then sigh and secretly shut the door on those memories, thinking, I'll never see them again? Um, plans for the ultimate reunion. For Joseph, of course, all of that had now changed. His brothers have surprisingly reemerged in Egypt. Through an incredible series of events we have followed with great interest, he was brought to the point where he revealed his identity to them. They knew, now knew not only that their brother Joseph was alive, but that he was the prime minister of Egypt. Even more important that they had reconciled their differences and come to terms with all past offenses since he was willing to forgive them for all the wrongs they did to him those many years ago. He told them that God's hand was in it all and that God's plan was running its perfect course. They had discussed everything that had happened in the intervening years, but things were not yet complete. The desire of Joseph's heart was to see his father and to get all the family to move to Egypt and live near him so he could provide for them without reservation and without limitation. We pick up the story at the point where the news of all these happenings reach the ears of Pharaoh. I have no idea. I'm a little nervous. Genesis 45, 16-20 now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. I get emotional sometimes. Now you are ordered, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives, and bring your father and come, and do not concern yourselves with your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. I'm just... I don't know about you, but um, life is hard. So not in the book, I'm just saying this, and and Joseph spent a lot of time in that pit. Spent a lot of time with people hating him, spent a lot of time with people mis mistreating him, abusing him, abandoning him. He spent a lot of time there in that dungeon. And we all have our own pit and we all have our own dungeons. And it's nice to see that there is good in his story because a lot of stories you see and you hear on this earth are not good are not good endings now we're not at the end yet so anything could happen but for this to happen to Joseph is awesome it's just so awesome and I pray that one day some wonderful things like this can happen to me I mean, not like, you know, Egypt and all that stuff, but it's hard to, every day, say, okay, God, I give it to you. I give you my fears. I give you my anxieties. I give you my, my, um, my doubts. And I'm just waiting on you to bless me. Now, in that time that you wait, you also have to do his will and you have to obey him. And um, it is hard for the flesh to do that when it has been so beaten up and been so taken advantage of, as well as Joseph has been taken advantage of by his brothers and, and by people in his life. And I mean, you know, it says that he was in a pit and he was in a dungeon, but you have no idea how many people went in there and came out. And, you know, they just tell you these two two people, the cupbearer and the chief baker, and they don't tell you all the rest that have been coming in and going out and, you know, who said what to him and what they did to him. And just like in our lives, you know, your family might think that they know you, but they might not really, you know, they don't know the the secrets that you have, the, the, 
things that have happened that you don't share. But it is nice to see that there are blessings in Joseph's story. And that would give me hope that there will be blessings in my story as well. So. I'm going to end it right here We're on page 154 and um, I think that's a good place to end for today. And I'm going to do a closing prayer as I feel the need to. Thank you, Father. for loving us beyond belief, for being the first to love us, the first to know us, for being constantly by our sides, whether we do right or do wrong. And you just keep on telling me, as well as the rest of your saints, hold on. That things are coming. Just hold on. Just hold on. And I just pray that whoever watches this with me will stand in faith. Maybe not stand in flesh, because flesh is so weak. But stand in faith that the blessings that you say that we will get are coming. And I know those blessings will be in heaven, but I also pray for blessings here on earth. Just to give us a little bit of a push in between those times where we think we can't go anymore. Where we have no more strength in ourselves. And we have to find the strength in you. So we pray and we thank you, Lord. That you are the Lord of our lives, that you are no dictator. You are no fascist. You are no person to say, go do that for me and maybe you will live. <laughs> You're not just a God that, that, that demands respect. You are a God that loves us and, and wants our love back. As much as you love us, you need that much love back. So I thank you, Lord, and I just claim for everybody out there, just hold on. Blessings are coming, just hold on. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Wow, I felt like this was a very emotional, moving session today. God is good. <laughs> God is, no, God is good. God deals with us all the time. He just deals with our whining and in and in and in and in. God, just God, you know how many, if, if we, if one person, whine or complain or yell at God as much as we do, imagine that multiplied all across the whole earth. The whole earth. God must get sick of that. He needs our praises. He needs, you know. He needs to be lifted up as well. We need to lift him up as much as he lifts us up, you know? So, thank you. God bless you. And uh, Joseph did it today, Joseph Day 24, and uh, very soon 25. Thanks.